this is a new show from the Banning Tree. It's called Sported Tales from Beyond the Field, where we bring you interesting stories from some of the very interesting people in the business of sport who are perhaps rarely spotted on the field, but sported very important roles behind the scenes. For our first episode today, we have Shorbuji Chatterjee with us, and I'd like to take this opportunity to ask him to tell us a little bit about what got him into the world of sport, how he's connected to it, and um, how he's had the connections he had. Shorbuji, could you please tell us? Hey, thanks, Sohan. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, also makes it special. It's the first episode, so I really hope I do justice to kicking this uh, series, and I'm sure it's going to be an amazing series. Uh, very interesting journey, Soham. Uh, almost two decades of working. Uh, I mean, I think split in almost two parts. The first part was, you know, where I was a professional and I've, I mean, I've worked across media organizations, essentially run marketing for a news network, I run marketing for a entertainment network. And probably the most brief uh, experience that I had, but also my most enjoyable was when I was heading marketing for a sports network for a couple of years. Uh, and for the last five years, I've been running my own uh, learning startup. So, uh, and that's a sport on a daily basis, right? I mean, everything, <laughs> everything you see on the playing field, I mean, it's running your own startup is all that and more. So, but yeah, yeah it's really passionate. Uh, I've not been very good at playing any sport, but really, really passionate as a fan. Okay, so what, just out of curiosity, which are the sports you follow passionately as a fan? I mean, I know you follow cricket, but apart from that, I do follow cricket. But uh, you know, I'm one of those where I can uh, watch any sport, and I think I've been quite fortunate, right? Even when I've been holidaying. So I think I was in, uh, you know, in Istanbul when in 2006 when they had their first Grand Prix. So I know I was there for that week, just a week before yeah. they were having their first, uh, you know, Grand Prix, and I saw all that excitement. I was there in Vancouver when, uh, you know, in that Stanley Cup, which is ice hockey, and uh, the Vancouver Canucks actually made it to the finals for the first time. So it doesn't matter where I am. I mean, you know, I have Sports. been. Yeah, yeah, follows I, you. When you I, mentioned. Uh, so, and I think that's all just luck, right? I mean, we were on an office offsite and we went up for a holiday. You know, we took a detour for a weekend to Amsterdam and, you know, Holland made it to the finals of the 2010 World Cup. So I think I've wow. just been there and, you know, uh, I have traveled to Lahore to watch cricket. I've watched, I mean, so I have. Travel to watch cricket, right? So for cricket, I mean, I don't think I'm just a regular fan. I think um, I go a little beyond that. Yes. Yeah. When yeah. you mentioned Istanbul, I thought you were about to say that you were there for the miracle of Istanbul, which was the Champions League that uh, yeah. Liverpool won from a comeback, and then that was like yeah. my yeah. dream uh, because it's one of my dreams to be in uh, a football stadium, like go and watch football at one of these places. For the closest, I have never actually watched a football match live, but I mean, the closest I've done is. I have watched Germany hammer Argentina 4-0 and I've sat ah. and watched it in the Munich Olympic Stadium okay, wow. with about 50,000 screaming fans and they had a, hundred, I mean, a giant 100 feet LED right where they were showing the match. Uh -huh. And because Argentina got hammered, you can imagine what must have happened <laughs> in Munich that evening. So, right. yeah, yeah. so that's right, the reason right. I come to watching it live. But, uh -huh. uh, yeah. Right. You mentioned uh, that your most enjoyable phase was during the stint you had as part of the broadcast network. Uh, could you just tell us a little bit about that, what it was like, uh, and then also if you want, which company? So I had joined uh, uh, lead marketing for Neo Sports, Neo Cricket, Neo Sports, uh, Nimbus. Uh, and I'll tell you why it was the most enjoyable, because for me, that actually opened my eyes to a world of sports outside cricket. Uh, this was in middle of 2011. Uh, I had just done the All India Darshan and traveled with the Indian team and seen them win the World Cup. Right, So I had actually gone and seen the Indian team play in every match. I think I just missed the quarterfinals in Ahmedabad, but I watched every other match. Right, And and I had taken my wife along, so and she still stays married to me. So, <laughs> you know, she's not much of a sports fan, but I had Probably taken because we won the World Cup. That, that was yeah, forgiven. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I must be grateful to Dhoni and the team for that. The rest is, but uh, so yeah, I mean, but it was still always cricket, right? And when I joined, uh, and I joined Neo also because they had the, you know, it was it had the, it was the first time a broadcaster actually launched a cricket specific channel called Neo Cricket. There was a lot of uh, wrap around ancillary programming around cricket, and I was really excited. And the first two events that I had to market were the Rugby World Cup and Copa America. <laughs> right. Okay. 
uh, and you know and so then i realized that there is more to football than premier league and world cup and euro because before that all of my football that i was following was you know uh, you know the marquee events and you know you realize there's more and there was uh, and rugby world cup and, we, and i never realized that you know rugby however small had a certain amount of following uh, you know with the consulates and the kind of rugby parties they were throwing when their consulates when their teams were playing uh, and you know i still remember it was early days of using social media and sports right and we just uh, you know created this entire thing of rug- a set of rugby rules right so we actually put this out saying that these are the rules that you know you know watch the match tomorrow morning with these rules in your hand and you'll start enjoying the sport and the number of people so today of course you know you measure conversations and you measure engagement and i mean there's someone who's just tracking that on a regular basis and we just put it out and i know i was our first semblance of probably seeing something that went kind of viral without it being intended to go viral so we just thought you know let's just put it out you know i mean you not have budgets to market a rugby world cup there no money out of a rugby world cup but since we had the right let's just see what we could do and that gave me i mean for me that was that's it you realize that you know there is a world outside cricket uh there are really passionate fans there the numbers might vary but you real i mean the engagement they provide is exactly what any marketer any business looks for all right and uh, can you just describe to me what sport broadcasting is like as a field i mean not just from a marketing perspective what what's it like to work there what's it like to be a part of things how do things move so if i compare sports broad- broadcasting with say any other marketing any other product right so the good part about sport broadcasting is that it's a monopoly so if i have the rights for a tournament if i have rights for a sport then no one else has it so unlike you know if i'm a bar of soap then a similar bar of soap exists right if i'm a cola then there's hardly anything to differentiate between one cola and the other right mm-hmm. but in sports it's exclusive right even in news for that matter it's not exclusive right i mean it's the same news and this is about who can scream louder today maybe that's your point of differentiation in sports it is purely you know what you have is exclusive but the experience you give the fan is what adds to it right so for example i remember uh, neo cricket had launched this show called dial c for cricket first time mm-hmm. ever could call in and anyone could call in right so from satara to shrinagar anyone could call in and speak to an expert right on the other end and ask a question and get it answered right today it's a lot mm-hmm. easier right you just tag ashwin and he will you know raise <laughs> up a test match he will answer all your questions himself but yeah. that isn't the case then so you know you actually got people closer to the expert so it's the wrap around it what you do even today if you actually notice for most uh, you know sports broadcasting the you know the mid season i mean the mid session breaks right viewers go into another channel or go into a digital platform to watch the analysis because the primary channel is probably just showing you know uh, castrol super fours and you know dlf mm-hmm. super fours right but they very mm-hmm. little of analysis on the host channel today because of commercial pressures mm-hmm. but uh, what you do right i mean at, i mean early stages espn did a great job i think uh, what neo did was really indenize the sport right gave it new heroes uh, brought in uh, new faces so you went i mean you know espn had those standard everything out of singapore right here you suddenly had people coming in and anchoring from india uh, so i mean whatever right so neo gave that i think mm-hmm. today star has taken it maybe a step forward with a lot more regional language uh, commentary yeah. and you know greater penetration true so, so i come back to your question now so on sports broadcasting uh essentially three parts to it if i may put right first is mm-hmm. getting the rights right mm-hmm. uh, because that's a large part right that's where all the bidding happens that's where uh you know uh, there are agents who represent various federations and you're striking deals and you're trying to do long term deals uh not everything is as uh, competitive like say the ipl bidding was but right uh, you try and package a few these things together you try and put that into your business so that's one part of it of getting the rights right the second part of it is in terms of production right uh, international events come to you as a plug and play option uh, and you just okay. do the wrap around programming uh, mm-hmm. sometimes you do the production yourself but how do you present that sport right that's very very important uh, and you see different channels right you see a channel like sony makes it a lot more entertaining right some channels mm-hmm. make it a lot more technical uh, mm-hmm. how do you want to peg it to the viewers so that's again a very important part of the programming piece and the final leg is distribution and marketing right i mean is it available to all and what's the kind of engagement i build with the viewers hmm. Hmm. 
So in mm. fact, I always say this, right? That pick any business. I mean, outside sport, pick any business, right? Whether you're an entrepreneur or a large behemoth, you know, what is it that you look for, right? As a marketer, what do you look for? You look for that you want a loyal, you know, base. So you want amazing brand loyalty. You want organic conversations to happen. You don't want to constantly have to keep, you know, pushing forceful moment marketing. You want organic conversations to happen. You want a strong mm. community. Today, everyone talks about this concept of, you know, we want a community, we want a tribe, right? And you want it to be addictive, right? And in my mind, there are only three industries which can legally provide this to anyone, right? I mean, alcohol, tobacco, but they're unfortunately injurious to health. And the third one is sports, yeah. <laughs> sports really does that, right? And that's the high of a marketer that, you know, it's beyond just watch, you know, something at 8 p.m. You know? It's much more than that, right? It is the level of engagement, the level of... Uh, and today with second screen experiences, it's become a lot more. Um, so it's, you know, even if it's, I mean, the pandemic and I'm say not watching a, a Liverpool game with you, which I would say otherwise, uh, which say, you know, community of friends. But today there's enough and more happening, right? So we're all watching and we're all tweeting about it and, you know, uh, you know, so that's great fun, right? Right. In fact, uh, you know, I'll make two comments about this. Uh, first of all, sports during the pandemic was probably like when sports came back, I think it was a big reason people actually took their minds off the whole thing and they were like, okay, we can get back to normal life in a certain sense. And the second thing was when you mentioned about uh, wraparound programming, which either becomes too technical or is accessible to more people. You know, the Premier League has a lot of coverage in football and they have like BT Sport has pretty good programming and Sky has pretty good programming. There's a very big difference between their shows, but they're so popular that, you know, people watch pirated streams just to get the analysis like I'm a viewer from India but maybe I'm watching that to listen to Gary Neville or, or uh, you know Scholes or someone like that so it's so popular that those channels get some traction even here in that so it's very uh, of course wraparound programming and how you build up to that you know match because they build up to these United City games as if it's the end of the world uh, sky and all so they do a great job of that so I think it's very very interesting um, just a question, since you, you know, managed to get there and, and your education is uh, in, in business, uh, how do you land up in these places? You know, if somebody wants to say land up in sports or in sports broadcasting, uh, should they be doing something different in their undergrad or is it just serendipity that helps you land up in these places? So again, speaking out of personal experience, right? And I don't, neither do I want to be judged, nor do I want to, you know, uh, you know, Prescriptive. But, you know, I've realized one thing as a marketer, right? I mean, my first uh, eight, nine years was with the Hindi news network. And I still can't speak Hindi to save my life. Uh, but <laughs> I, right, I managed fine. I mean, you know, I think that was okay. Uh, yeah, b- bad combination. Bengali living in Bombay and <laughs> down south, right? So, I mean, but, yeah. but I still was, you know, uh, what I could manage. Right. I work for an entertainment channel and maybe I don't consume the content, but I understand basics of consumer inciting. I understand basics of my role. I've always been a very passionate, diligent marketer. So went about doing everything right. But I think sports is one industry where the only, uh, you know, degree that you need is you need to be a sports fan. It doesn't matter which sport because you need to realize that. And I'll give you an example, right? Uh, you can never wake me up early in the morning. I mean, if I have an early morning flight, I don't sleep that night. Even today, I cannot wake up early in the morning. When is the only time I wake up early in the morning? When India is touring Australia. And on the first day of the test match, I wake up half an hour before to even see the test uh, on the toss, right? (laughs) But that's a fan, right? Who who changes everything they cannot do otherwise for that, right? And all of us have that, right? Some people do it for a book. Some people do it for, you know, watching movies. I mean, you know, binging on Netflix, whatever it is. But that kind of, you need to be a sports fan. I think you cannot not be passionate about sports and be doing anything in a sports network. Hmm. True. That's fundamental. I mean, everything else in every other industry I've seen, you learn on the job, you understand what's required of you and you can be fine and you can be good at it. Hmm. But right. I think, and it's always good to be passionate, right? When you're passionate, you know, it adds that extra layer of it, right? Like, I mean, I mean I'm not understood sure Hindi, but I've always been a news hound, right? So, I, it really worked well for me. But in sports, I think if you're not a sports fan, I mean, you will not even go from zero to one. Forget going all the way to the other thing. Right. Uh, 
So I think that's one. I think it's also evolved today, right? Uh, so I mean, I remember from campus, I actually took a job uh, with a broadcaster, and that was their first batch of management training that they were launching, right? And what was maybe perceived to be a huge risk, and what is this guy doing, and you know all of that. But uh, but I was passionate. I mean, I knew a little bit of the media industry. I was a copywriter before I did my MBA, so you know it was almost like homecoming for me to go back there. Uh, so it was great fun. But uh, you know, today I think you know today I think if you look at it's got a lot more corporatized. Sports has got a lot more corporatized. You know, uh, franchises have come in not just in cricket but in multiple sports. Right, uh, brands realize that sports as a tool for of engagement is really, really good. Uh, not only engagement, but sports for going hyper local. Right, uh, you know, sometimes you know if you go to some of these, and then I remember uh, when we were working on it, launching a, a rural channel for one of the entertainment networks. Right, you are going into media dark regions where there is no media. Right, so there is no television. There is no. I mean, there is just one now. DD Free Dish, which is like a you know, free DTH that's there, but where do you advertise your channel? And you see, mm. but over there, you still have these local football matches and you still have local. So even when you're going hyper-local, sports becomes a great place to aggregate people and communities together. So mm. I think the role of sports has also evolved. And mm. uh, so it's no longer just one or two sports marketing agencies, as they call themselves, you know, mm. who are on the show. And that's mm. only good, right? Because that's only helping you take sport deeper and wider so what you're saying is essentially if you have the passion and if you understand the dna of being a sports uh, enthusiast or fan uh, then you probably there are enough opportunities now you can make your way there by you know working towards it uh, maybe one step at a time uh, right so uh, i i also happen to know that you are part of the setting up uh, the super structure that became World Series Hockey. Uh, and I'd like to know that, you know, India and hockey have a weird connection. So we were supposed to be really good. At one point we were, then we were not that good, but the country thinks we should be good. So it's like a sport that's in the consciousness in the country somewhere, even if not ever present, but it's been there. Uh, but I've growing up, I've never, you know, really thought of it as aspirational and hip. Uh, till people started talking about it, when, which was when this thing came about. So I want to know why it took so long for this particular sport to come into the limelight in this sort of form. Uh, so I'll uh, give you a little bit of context, right? I mean, really had a blast working on World Series Hockey and the challenges were immense, right? Because on one hand, you were building a category, right? Uh, you know, you were actually building a category in a... Uh, where, and and the, the like you, I think, rightly captured it that uh, we should have always had that, but we didn't. Right, so we were building a category. So, uh, and I'll tell you when we were the marketing of World Series Hockey, and I'll give you a very interesting anecdote. I come a little later, but you were also fighting the administrator. So, you know, you had IHF, and then you had uh, Hockey India, which and both of them fought for you know who's supposed to run hockey, okay? And uh, both of them were at loggerheads. So, you know, players who came and signed up for World Series Hockey, and Nimbus and uh, the Indian Hockey Federation together had launched this, right? So, Hockey India went against it. And then they kept, you know, threatening players. And I mean, I'm not going to get into what all they did, but they made it a nightmare for us, right? And when you're building a category and you have those kind of hurdles, remember, it's also difficult to then get sponsors. I mean, you know, before we would unveil, you know, our title sponsor, they would go and put out a press release saying these four players have backed out, right? I mean, it became, I mean, just imagine, right? India and Pakistan can never be on the same page on anything. But for this, even the Pakistani Hockey Federation came out and gave a letter saying this is the Rebel League. <laughs> Oh, wow. Of course, right. and because we had we had their former captain, right? So Rehan Butt was the captain of I think the Chandigarh team, if I remember right. So I mean, you know, with all that, you know, turmoil, you were still trying to build a brand and still trying to build a category. Having said that, you know, ESPN had actually done something similar, uh, and almost uh, you know seven eight years before World Series Hockey came out, right? But the only difference was in sport, right? You really need to build this home and away. You need to create affinity for a team. So I cannot have three teams playing on one ground and I'm supposed to root for it. It doesn't happen. I need to have a team that's my own team, that's staying in my city, that's touring my city, that's creating engagement in my city. And then it's traveling and there's a home advantage. And then you're, you know, so that's what World Series Hockey did, right? We had eight teams. We had clear cities. They were based out of their city. You had home and away matches. Uh, and to be fair, IPL had already introduced the concept of franchise-based sports in India. 
So IPL had already done that. So people knew that okay, I can have a team which I can root for. Uh, I mean, you know, you still had local teams in Ranji, but somehow yeah. franchise this got popular, right? So to be mm-hmm. fair, you know, also if I look at it, you know, so we had two ways of approaching World Series hockey, right? From a marketing context, we could have played the glory card that bring back glory to India and bring back glory, right? Mm-hmm. Or we could have played the fact that you know hockey is a very very interesting sport to watch. It's super engaging. It's super fast. Uh, you know, it's an extremely. I mean, in fact, if you ask me from a pure interest standpoint, and if I look at, if I do a cross section between uh, how interesting and engaging it is to watch and the potential reach, hockey is still, I think, would be number two in India. So after cricket, it would still be hockey. So tennis okay. is super engaging, but super, tennis might never have that reach, right? Uh, football, you will never have local talent. I mean, so even if you look at ISL, and I'm sure you know they're really doing, trying to do a great job, but it is not. I mean, it is the number five league in the world, right? At the best, so it will mm-hmm. come after Premier League, Serie A. It will come after uh, La Liga. It will be definitely after Bundes. Where, but that's not the case with hockey. Hockey, you could create an IPL like the best hockey league in the world, right? Get the best players into it, and it's a great sport to watch. So that way, I think it was made for that. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons why India and Pakistan, for that matter, stopped doing well in hockey is Hockey became less of a game of skill and more of a game of power. So you know you went for you went you know you had now turf. Uh, uh, you had to play on turf. The ball moved much faster. The offside rule went away. So you know you could have players from one end like you're losing a lot of. So that's how a lot of the European teams came up. You know because they came. I mean they are stronger built, right? I mean they are they played. I mean India was all about that wizardry of hockey. Mm-hmm. So, in a sense, I mean, almost like a, I mean, today we complain about the pitch and whether India is doing that. In hockey, it was the reverse happened to us, right? Wherein the game changed to suit others and take away our advantage. Right. 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 But uh, so we actually stayed away from playing the glory card on hockey. Okay. We actually, uh, you know, played the fact that you know this is a really tough sport and a really really interesting sport. And that, I mean, and you know, we had that thing of what do we do, right? I mean, there is an entire audience set who had probably followed hockey till, you know, the 60s, 70s. And do we get them back? Or do we try and build a new community of people who not watch the sport, but give them something to at least come and sample and hope that, you know, they find it engaging enough to stay. And we actually went with the latter and, you know, our initial opening numbers were really good, right? So we went past, I mean, you know, we were at that time, that's of course the second biggest uh, league sport in India after IPL. So, you know, we really, I think the promise was that hockey, and even today, if promoted well, especially when you look at what Kabaddi has delivered and what some of the other sports are trying to do, hockey, mm-hmm. I still think, has the potential to be. Because you will get the best players. I mean, mm-hmm. besides the European League, there are not, not, not too much that's happening in hockey. You can actually create an IPL like structure, get the best players in. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, your ISL is only going to get retired players. It's not going to get the best players to ever come in as well. Right. Uh, uh, interesting, you mentioned the IPL and the IPL and the Hockey League uh, because I want to contrast something and run it by you. So the IPL, uh, because it's about cricket and cricket already has a structure built from the ground up to all these coaching centers, coaches, trainers, school level competitions and so on. It's very easy for them to spot and groom talent from a young age because that cricket is it's the madness around the country, um, right? So that's easy for them to do. And then in football, that level of uh, structure is absolutely not present at all. Uh, at least where I grew up, I grew up in Calcutta. So uh, football is very popular in Bengal. But even here, we don't have that level of infrastructure or setups or coaches for football, uh, even despite the interest. Okay, But hockey in parts of the country is absent. It's not even, it's not even visible because here growing up, I didn't see hockey at all. You know, so we don't have the infrastructure to do what the IPL did with talent and local talent, as you were mentioning. So how do the benefits of there being a very publicized, very popular league translate into getting talent into the game from a young age? So fabulous. I think it's, it's a good question. So I mean, I'm saying in cricket, I mean, like my, I mean, my favorite example is, you know, the miracle that you pulled off at GABA, right? comes from the fact that sports got commercialized to the extent that you had a bench strength that could go and beat. Right? This was not possible 10 years back in Indian sport. Right? Um, mm-hmm. And Dilgar got out and you all switched off the team. Right? And from there, you've come a long way where you've got a B team and a C team and 
you know, uh, right? I mean, all of them coming in and you know being able to contribute. But in hockey, I felt the same way, right? I mean, my only exposure to hockey was that I've heard stories from my grandfather who followed the sport then, uh, and he was from the same town as uh, the legendary Dhyan Chand. So you know, he really spoke a lot about hockey. That was my. And then when I was in boarding school, I played a little bit of hockey, right? Because they play every sport. Uh, but that was it. And I thought the same, right? You know, he was biting and this thing. And uh, obviously, I mean, you know, uh, you know, whether it was the chairman at Nimbus, the team that was building World Series hockey, they had. I mean, I came in when they had they had decided to do World Series hockey, right? Uh, and and you know, what, my first assignment I was sent on was to actually go travel up north and just scan schools and figure out what's happening. And you know, I mean, you know, there were two states we didn't even touch, right? So I mean, the entire Jharkhand region and Orissa we didn't even touch. We didn't have. I mean, that was the plan for subsequent years where you would expand. But you go to Madhya Pradesh, right? Uh, parts of pockets of Bangalore, uh, you know. I mean, all of Punjab mostly, right? I mean, in fact, Punjab was split into two teams. We had a Chandigarh team and a Punjab team to talent. Also. It's amazing. You would still see school kids going in there with their hockey sticks uh, in tier two, tier three towns, right? Uh, I mean, we actually did a clinic across two hundred schools, and we actually did a competition across them, and we could, because our entire idea was that if these kids know that there's a hockey match happening in their city, they'll get their parents along, right? And they'll watch it in the stadium, and they will. Parents, I mean, they'll force their parents to watch it on TV. So that was our thing, right? We actually uh, felicitated all the hockey players from the schools. They right? would go during their assembly, and we did this ground activation where you know about 200, 300 schools event, and you know uh, all the entire hockey team that played for the school got you know this thing, and and then you know whatever, right? They got a season pass to watch World Series hockey, and we did all of that. But of course, the objective being that we wanted to get them to the stadium to watch and also you know watch it as make them the ambassador. But you know, so this is. It's, there, there are still parts of the country where hockey is watched, hockey is played with a fanatic level of uh, engagement. Yes, because it's not been a popular uh, sport on TV, the larger mass has not been exposed to it. Right, mm. and what happens sometimes is you know even when the sport is not happening, if it's there on television, you casually seem to sample it. Right, you will casually mm. seem to sample it. The more you sample it, you tend to get drawn towards it. So the catch mm-hmm. twenty two, right? I mean, uh, broadcasters won't put it on air because it probably doesn't rate. But unless you put it on air and give it that, you know, uh, opportunity to see, you're not going to get in viewers as well. So mm-hmm. now I'm just hoping with digital platforms, a lot of that could change because you could actually have uh, dedicated, uh, you know, platforms for sports that probably doesn't get enough um, space because at the end of the day, uh, there is a long tail of sport that still has the same passion that the popular sport has. It's just that the popular sport, because it's more popular and television is linear, so you're forced to maybe fit that onto it. But digital, because it's non-linear, you could actually then serve the long mm-hmm. sport, right? I mean, mm-hmm. classical. I mean, if you look at it, uh, in even in Premier League, there are just those few matches that are shown on television in India, right? Because mm-hmm. someone decides that these are the more important teams. True. But True. Right? if you have a limited uh, display, I mean, you you exactly. probably get. The most popular I mean, channel. The last Olympics is when uh, I think NBC and YouTube did this, right? Where they actually said that we have streams for all sports, right? Because television would only show you what they feel is important, mm. right? But uh, if there's on YouTube, you could have like a channel for every sport. Every and sport. Sport. So I think that's the future of sport, right? I mean, we're all moving towards. Interesting, you interesting you mentioned that. Um, would you like to talk a little bit more about how broadcasting is changing? Uh, with the coming of OTT and you know pay per views and such, uh, so that you can really popularize different sports and also change the set of viewers who have you know the access. So I think the one, I mean, the one challenge I see with you know the business side of sports is that uh, the business models haven't changed. Uh, so like I said, the beauty of sport is even on the long tail, right? Sports that might have, I mean, so take rugby, take golf. I mean, they would have very very niche. following but that niche following is still the intensity is very high their propensity to pay is very high so uh, you know a golf viewer would be okay with uh, spending 500 600 rupees a month to watch his favorite golf channel but what happens is because in india i mean uh, it's all advertising linked so you would only take sports that's going to get you maximum advertising revenue it's linear uh, you know subscription is hardly a business and uh, you know i hate saying this i spoke about how administrators tend to interfere in sport 
the government does that with broadcasting so you know the price of milk and essentials is not regulated in this country right that's market driven but your pricing for the television channels are so you know you have got fixed packs and you can only price it at certain amount there's something called must provide but otherwise think of it right look at it say in the us where a dth a dth channel could actually launch an entire sports channel and buy sports and that's their uh, right to win so you know they use it to get consumers onto their platform it's a premium package which you buy right and that's the only place you get it but here i mean you cannot launch a golf channel like that right if i mean a tata sky cannot launch it and not give it to the other dth provider so i think that's where i think it needs to change where uh, and i think ott will do that and i'll share a very interesting story so you know like you spoke about how the ipl was like this oasis in the desert and you know so even before the ipl right for example i think pakistan was playing england so that was shown on television but the caribbean premier league was going on okay and no television channel in india was showing the caribbean premier league and i actually watched it in one of those streaming platforms okay i actually found a streaming platform in india was showing it and i watched it there because obviously your star for cricket and that was you know uh, and perfect right i mean uh, and all the players you're going to see in ipl in a month month and a half from then you actually saw them play there so uh, but i see that happening to a lot more of these uh, you know what i call long tail sports uh, i mean even test matches for that matter right i mean a broadcaster pays anything between 50 to 60 crores per test match uh, if it gets over in two days or three days you're not going to make any advertising revenue to recover that right but what if all test matches were on a platform and you paid 500 rupees to watch a series right you would get enough people and make more money than probably what advertising makes true but those business models are not changing right for whatever reason and i think that will change going forward i mean with- i i think those business models i think one reason that those aren't changing is because the ownership structures are so different like you know the interest of a owner of a sports or a sports broadcaster and that of a franchise or a league um you know going together like they clash very much so just just as an example uh in england uh, football is like you know it's crazy and people travel to games to watch like people are going say even from manchester they are going to london to watch arsenal and chelsea play mm-hmm. right and and uh, that so that involves a lot of travel and logistics hotel bookings flight or uh, you know train reservations and what happens is the timing of the game is decided by sky sports and bt bt sport because because they are deciding okay what time of day they are the athletic team running behind tell them okay this many viewers at this time of the day uh, and this day of the week so sometimes what happens is the interest of the broadcaster because they pay the majority of the revenue comes before the interest of both the game and the fan which is where i think the rigidity of the models comes from because of this Clash. You know the interesting thing, at least Premier League still has some games which are actually called media blackout games, right? Where mm-hmm. those games are not shown on any channel, so that just forces local people to come and fill up stadiums. Is it? I didn't know this. So Premier League, and I'm, I don't know if it, I mean, at least till five years back, I know they were doing that. So there were some yeah. games that were uh, media blacked out completely. Okay. Because they still wanted the you know the fans to come in and watch it live, right? Okay. uh the one of the most profitable leagues in the world is actually bundesliga right apparently uh their stadiums are always full so i know bundesliga was the first league that started you know uh live football and you know they played to empty stadium and because bundesliga never plays to an empty stadium they are the most i mean uh, and if you look at the dispersion between what the winning team makes and the team that's probably last on the list uh all of them are profitable So as a league, it's the most profitable league in the world as a sum total. Mm. In other mm. leagues, the top two or three, four teams make a lot of money mm. and they don't do anything, right? So mm. and it all it's all because people go and watch it live. Uh, mm. And you know, I mean, I must tell you this, right? With hockey, one of the things you know, it was almost like a KRA for me, right? Saying that the stadium should be full because anyway, hockey is a smaller stadium, but it's that noise and energy that fans bring on that actually gets. translated through that broadcasting this thing hmm. i have seen cricket matches where you know it's an empty stadium but there's one small quadrant that's probably full and the cam the broadcasters are only you know focusing on that and the rest of the street you try and watch sport and now we are all watching sport with empty stadium it's not the same impact it's not the same in fact they have to play artificial crowd noises absolutely uh, to bring people that emotion 
but i really think i mean you know on this that this ott for sports and you know a platform which is able to merge multiple streams right so you have your live feed and then you have maybe an, an analytics special which is for the the connoisseurs of that sport and then you have you know an engagement piece along with digital allows you to put all of that together right so True. i think that's the future at least uh, and early mm-hmm. signs of what we're seeing in the west is all moving towards that so i think mm-hmm. that's the future the other one is pay per view right i think we still not used to it i mean probably movies is what we've seen as pay per view on some of the dtt channels where uh, but uh, but i think pay per view again i mean in the us boxing is always pay per view right and and there it's anything you know from 15 dollars a match to 50 dollars a match but you generate a significant amount of revenue out of that so i think the good thing a combination of what jio and netflix has done is jio has ensured that you know connectivity is not expensive and netflix and has ensured that you are willing to pay for great content so mm. you know combination of two and i think hotstar is doing that with cricket you know i really see i think hotstar doing a good job and i think that they'll do that with multiple sports i mean with the cricket model um, yeah yeah you know something world series hockey i'm sorry i want to tell you yeah. so one of the most interesting things we had done for world series hockey was we actually tied up with youtube for a global live broadcast and uh, you know and it was a pure experiment it was an experiment for youtube and it was an experiment it was the first time they did that in india for any sport okay with the first go and you know we both of us looked at it as an experiment because we had no clue so they also couldn't guarantee these are the kind of numbers and we also didn't know what the kind of ex- but it did so well because we had so many players from you know different parts of the world from you know argentina to malaysia and it started out with first hearing from them that oh our parents are now watching you know our family is watching the game now on youtube okay right? was the first time we did world series hockey right you would not have all your global licensing in place in terms of the broadcast deal mm. but youtube suddenly opened it up for everyone and in and on year one objective was not to make money out of youtube right eventually mm. course, we did a lot more uh, where we figured out how to you know so i think we also did french open with them eventually and a lot of other sports but for world series hockey we said just open the tap right make it free let's just try and see the reach mm. and it was amazing right i mean i think you know we had other players reaching out to us saying we want to play in the next league we had uh, and you can i mean you could track all of it on engagement right so the engagement was not just you know indians but you know people saying we're staying up till 3 in the morning to watch you know so that kind of things right so we realized that maybe the future is that right which is uh, live but you know it's also available on the shelf which you could go back and watch later uh, mm-hmm. on linear so mm-hmm. So that was another very interesting uh, experiment. Of course, today that experiment, I mean, today it's become a lot. I mean, today it's you know it's very common. But at that time, we were the first to do it, and I think that was another very interesting experiment. I was just about to mention to you that uh, actually Netflix ranks at the top of the list of uh, companies in terms of uh, revenue per employee. They've done that good of a job at getting people to pay for stuff. that they are ranked above apple google microsoft and they are double of uh, google and they're about 70% more than apple so they are like 2.7 million dollars uh, of revenue per employee uh, which is just just mind blowing for me it's very different from sport i wonder what happens if they get into the business of you know live streams and because they certainly have the money uh, and then, see the other thing is they also have that reach right i mean i think mm-hmm. uh, so at least with you know and if i go back even like you know about 15 years back right when we had cable you know used to have cable channels right so you, your tv set had anything between 30 channels and 100 channels right and the cable mm-hmm. operator chose to play with channel he wanted to right at that time the uh-huh. fight is to be how do i get the cable operator to, to turn me on i mean cricket he was forced to do it but how mm-hmm. do i get him to turn me on right even in cricket right for the longest time you had to i mean broadcasters had to share their feed with dd how are you going to monetize in that case right i mean see monetization is not a bad word right i mean commercialization and monetization is what grows the sport hmm. oh look at only one person i mean look at what goes back into the sport right i mean and hmm. i think ipl you know for yes i mean you I might find the you know the concept of this auction very very uh, you know repulsive etc and all that but look what it's done to the sport right just look what it's done to the sport i mean today you have and i think i'd done this okay i'd done this analysis sometime back just i think out of it is that i'd looked at the 83 world cup team right and it was delhi 
Bombay and Karnataka, which gave almost on a you know for a squad of thirteen or fourteen, there were about ten or eleven players from this. Right, so maximum. You look at look at the last World Cup. Okay, look at a squad in the last World Cup. Right, there are about almost fifteen people or uh, fifteen Ranji teams giving you players for eighteen members. Right, so it's that spread out. Hmm. Let's now, open the open the field up for people. I mean, we talk of I mean you know today corporates speak about you know DNI and your diversity policy, right? I mean look what cricket has done, right? I mean today North I and mean, BCCI for example launched this entire program for getting Northeast right for developing cricket in Northeast. Already mm-hmm. you see you know, players from there are now coming in. in the IPL I mean Riyan Parag is already doing well, right? Mm-hmm. And you would clearly have maybe players from there. I mean and with the talent that they have, right? I mean. I mean, this got mm-hmm. talent to play any sport. I mean, yeah. in another few years, you would have Indian cricketers from Northeast. Yeah. Right? That's what it does, right? I mean, when uh, a sport becomes, you know, commercially viable, it mm-hmm. just keeps paying back in spades, right? I mean, it just, I mean, you know, I mean, I know so many stories, right? I mean, for me, right, all of us. I mean, we've all been. And I used to like take cricket coaching, right? When did my cricket coaching start? Stop when I turned fourteen and I went into eighth or ninth standard, right? I mean, that's the story of all of us. <laughs> that's right? my story too. <laughs> Everyone, but yeah. if you have a viable option, right? So today I don't have to. I mean, today you don't have to be an Indian cricketer to make money, yeah. right? You don't have to be an Indian cricketer to make money. I mean, if you, I mean, I was, I was amazed that even Ranji players get paid that much now per game. So it's even. I mean, just being a Ranji cricketer, you'll be well off. Right, getting picked for an IPL team lottery. Right, so now suddenly that pool is no longer fifteen players, but fifteen twenty players. In fact, today it's a problem of plenty for us with India, mm-hmm. India A under nineteen. I mean, it's a problem of plenty, right? I mean, I mean, look at the players bench. Right, I feel we should have two test playing teams. Right, one should, should play South Africa, Australia, England, and the other one should go and play West Indies, Bangladesh, <laughs> so, so that we can rest the best. Uh, no, or give them a chance. We have two series playing simultaneously. <laughs> okay, so right. Uh, I don't uh, regularly follow cricket, so I'm not uh, really aware. Then it's this this level of the bench strength that we do have. But I was awake watching the last uh, day of that match in Australia. Uh, sort of rekindled some of that uh, emotion uh, which I had growing up for the sport, in which I lost because I stopped playing, stopped watching regularly. But it does it? It stays with you. Uh, interesting that you also spoke of monetization and the impact that that can have on the, you know, the downstream effects of it on a sport. And we all know that it's happened for uh, cricket in India with the IPL. Do you have any story or anecdote about any other sport which has seen such an impact anywhere in the world? That you know of from your experience? Um, so obviously in India, because we're a single sport country, you know. There's a multiplier impact on that sport, right? Because everything that sport is always under the microscope and gets, right? Yeah. But if you look at countries like, say, Germany, Australia, where you know, uh, you know, South Africa, which has a sporting culture, right? They, in fact, mm. play multiple sports, right? And there are so many players who could have either played this or that for the national team, right? Mm. Uh, so there, it's a way of life, you know. That's a far more evolved way of being, maybe. Mm. But the other good thing is that what also happens is when we look at sport, we tend to look at one national sport or a Mm. You know, a mass sport and then television, right? But mm. also, what's happened is if you just look at sports as engagement, and hence the changes it makes. Sorry, if you look at marathon, for example. Mm. Look at the number of people running marathons today, right? I mean, of course, it's called a marathon, but they run the ten kilometer or half marathon or whatever, right? <laughs> but, you know, I, I think Hutch was the first. I mean, Hutch started it in Bombay. I mean, Delhi and then Bob, whatever, right? The Bombay marathon has been running for a while now. But just look at it right now. Though, for me, that's I mean, sport doesn't just need to be you know watching one sport and you know whatever, right? It's it's for me sports as a tool for engagement of mobilizing communities, getting them out and you know participating. Uh, I mean, I remember we did a version of the marathon, uh, and so just after my stint in sports broadcasting, I joined an entertainment uh, broadcaster which also had a newspaper. And uh, in that, for example, we actually did something called the women's marathon because one of those marketing challenges, right? Not enough women read newspapers, and how do I? And we had a lot of supplements and products outside entertainment, which we thought was you know women focused. 
I think we actually launched. I mean, you know, this women's marathon in Bombay, right? Twenty yeah. thousand participants registered. About fifteen thousand turned up to run. Celebrities came in to run, saying that so they, we thought celebrities, and you know, what will they ask for and all? But they just came in as participants. Okay. So celebrities came in as participants to run, right? Celebrities from the world of modeling and television and all of them. And you suddenly realize that you know. In BKC, in the, on, on a Sunday morning, right? You know, you had some fifteen thousand women running, and you know, each of them having three or four family members cheering for them, and no other event like that in Bombay would get that kind of people, right? Or, for example, uh, you know, we had taken one of the, you know, uh, a popular football player and did these uh, soccer clinics for eight-year-old kids, eight to ten-year-old kids, because at that time our thing was that. You know, parents of so eight eight year old kids you can't send them alone. So the parents have to come along, <laughs> right? So we don't tap the parents, but we did this, and we had to turn away people saying, "Sorry, you know, we can't sign up more than two hundred, three hundred per weekend." Okay. And you know, and so that these were all students out after sports, right? But you realize there is that latent need that's completely mm-hmm. untapped. So for right. me, if you look at the business of sport; it's all of this which is untapped. I mean. Broadcasting, yes, is the most visible, mm-hmm. but there is all this that happens, right? I mean, and of course, I mean, I was able to launch all these because coming from sports, and I thought that it's a smarter way of you know, doing it. But uh, I remember for one of the reality shows on the entertainment channel, we actually built this view. So we took the concept of you know your fantasy league, and we said let's do it for participants because the show is to get great ratings, but the engagement, I mean, you know, the week on week engagement was falling. We said why can't we borrow? Okay. Sport. So look at the way. So we got people. You know, the viewers could make their own teams on which three participants, and depending on how they fared in that episode, they got points. So there was almost a parallel competition, right? So we draw an amazing engagement, right? So we got this younger audience to come into an entertainment channel who probably you know were going away from it, who would prefer mm-hmm. to watch the same show uh, digitally later on. But you know, so things like that, right? I think sports really has its roots uh, across society. it's not just classical you know broadcasting that we see and i think the future is where all of it comes together and you you find ways to tap because all of this i mean there's no that's not less money right if you aggregate all of this then sports is a very very large industry by itself hmm mm-hmm. absolutely i agree and, and you know uh, this sort of downstream effect that you had about that uh, sport the football clinic and uh, the idea that you can use this eng- engagement from a marathon to propagate the idea of the newspaper to the crowd which isn't reading i this is normal to me I and mean, i haven't thought of it that way and uh, even being in b school this sort of application of marketing i i really haven't been uh, you know not trading in cases of this sort so maybe you should uh, should come over to am calcutta and uh, write one of these into a case for us i think it's quite interesting to hear um so i i also you know you have experience uh, in the sports uh, arena it, as someone who's been part of the managerial superstructure you would have seen how sports and politics interact in our country and uh, how they interact outside so do you have any uh, opinion on whether it's good for the game it's bad for the game it's a necessary evil what's your what's your take i don't know i mean so i have a very simple i mean i'll tell you the way i deduce it right obviously the impact is so vast that the politicians are forced to get into it right okay. if yeah. the impact was not vast they wouldn't care right they would go and chase mm-hmm. movies because probably you know i haven't seen politicians go after movies and say oh, feature me in this movie <laughs> yeah right? but they want to name stadiums after themselves I mean, <laughs> so right. it just tells me what the impact is right at the end of the day i mean i it doesn't matter a politician or b politician par one party or the other right i mean mm-hmm. i am critical towards all of them i'm True. equally critical towards all of them uh, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter if it was the first prime minister of our country it doesn't matter if the current prime minister of our country i don't mm-hmm. think stadium should be named after them right? that's right. my personal view but uh, i would say that it just tells me that that's the kind of impact and positive equity they hope to get from sport but that's why they are uh yeah that's why they that's why they they're also in in uh, in various terms of course uh, positive equity visibility um, association 
and also oh. the monetary impact on on small time uh, I, just, i mean i just that's my conclusion from it right i mean if it mm-hmm. was i mean if it was as if sports was insignificant they wouldn't want to do it right obviously it's of such high significance that it's being done um mm-hmm. it's sad i mean yes i mean you know if you go wherever you go you would find sportsmen all over somehow mm-hmm. in our country i mean last count i think there are about 11 or 12 stadiums that are all cricket stadiums that are all named after politicians right uh, or administrators right um, and you know some of them have done a great job and you know uh, and they're not there anymore and you know uh, god bless them but i don't think a stadium should be. i mean bishan singh bedi did a great job right i don't know if you're aware of that so he yeah. actually he's got a stand named after him and okay. uh, they were planning to name the delhi stadium after one of the politicians who's passed away recently so he said then don't just remove my name from the stand i don't want to be i mean you're naming the stadium after someone who's done a sweet little for the sport in this city mm-hmm. so i wouldn't want to be part of it they did that in uh, in a way uh, to protest uh, an opposition right so okay, because uh, this is this sort of thing is alien to me so i don't follow the indian scene as closely as you would because i'm not interested in the sports that are quite uh, popular here but i'm a big arsenal fan mm. so uh, when arsen wenger retired for me i grew up with him and it was uh, almost natural to hope that the stadium or stand would be named after him didn't happen you know one of the reasons it didn't happen because we were sponsorship deal running with the emirates till 2027 and you know perfectly okay in fact i feel you know what they should do they should get brands to endorse it so why why call it the vankade stadium you know yeah. call it the reliance geo stadium you know why call it <laughs> you know absolutely at least get money for it at least get yeah, some exactly. money for it and put it back in the game right so put it back in the game right and the contract is that they will be here for five years and they should also uh, you know we had that right so i still remember when bcci and nimbus was the first company that really bid you know like Uh, a lot of money to get cricket rights right? but i think one of the parts of the contract was that we would do our bit to improve grassroots level cricket and so we had to do that it's mm-hmm. part of the contract with bcci which is great right i mean when the federation themselves are looking at you know yes we'll make money but we're going to plow it back into this it's wonderful mm-hmm. right i mean it's win win for all them so can you just share something that you know nimbus would have done to improve grassroots sport or any like the football playing thing is a way that you know did was meant to be a marketing thing uh, and also the marathon also was sort of marketing but can you tell us something with nimbus or or anywhere where you work uh, no, so, you know, so i'll tell you what nimbus one of the good things that nimbus did was that nimbus was i mean neo cricket was the first channel that actually started showing all the ranji matches and the important ranji matches with high quality production and what we used to do was we used to actually cross promote ranji matches within live cricket so for example uh and so we obviously i mean for example we didn't have the ipl right but we looked at the stars of ipl and would say that okay you can watch yusuf pathan play in on this thursday from this to this you could watch so you know we picked up ipl stars of course because ipl had made them famous yeah. and uh, obviously we had interest in viewership going up but uh-huh. what it does is you know suddenly you're improving i mean you know when this broadcast of something and it's there constantly you're going to be able to so we took that on you know in terms of uh, the and for hockey we really did a lot i mean when we were long mm-hmm. world series hockey that was one uh, place where we did a lot at the grassroots level and at a school level we were very very clear that we want to target school level because you know kids getting encouragement there would mean that they don't give it up soon right i mean because that's for me the tricky period when you give up sports right most people give up sports they're right. going school for whatever right higher just education just before higher school higher education so you tend to believe that there's higher education and there's sports right implying that <laughs> yeah so it's very interesting that the us um, sort of uh, educational system they do it very differently in fact sports is sometimes a way for less academically gifted people to get into world class programs because they sponsor them uh, as you know as a sporting contingent you take okay. win medals for us and you know your fees are paid uh, by that so uh in fact sports quota does exist uh, in india over in some places but it's a quota it's not a selection mechanism entirely basis uh, sports so i think that's that's one way we could possibly improve because so people don't drop off at that point the funnel sort of goes a little longer yeah um so that that's true so you, you know you, i think you would have been in contact with um, you know several key figures of of various sports given your uh, commitments and engagements you have any ex- interesting stories or experiences 
could share a couple of them which uh, you should don't uh, want to name anyone you can go about without naming anyone but go ahead no i mean it's the amount of passion that they have right and uh, so i won't name any one per se right but i just talk about i mean you know uh, so i've been lucky right i mean even when i was with the news network we used to sign up a lot of um, sports professionals for you know coming in as experts you know and those were the good old days when you had news anchors and you had experts right today news anchors have become experts unfortunately but you had experts and you would get a lot of them and you know it's very interesting but most people from sports right they all their journey is very similar there's a lot of hardship they face one as a player to try and make it then administrators and you know the politics of all of that but it's amazing the passion that runs through right so from i mean you know no matter i mean you know all of them have a very similar journey that you know it's against all odds what they do uh but uh, yeah not one person now want to single out any one story as such and i mean uh, some of my closest friends are either administrators or you know i mean are still associated with sports so i think 2013 is when i quit 2012 2013 is when i quit nimbus but uh, so after that i've never worked with a you know sports brand as such but some of my closest friends do yaar and i really envy them because i think they get to uh, experience sports from the best seat in the house while i still do it from the television screen but <laughs> yeah. right so i'll uh, end with this uh, thing this was all about the business of sport right uh, but but what does sport mean to you as a person what is it meant for you in your life uh, whether as a player or just as a fan what what does sport represent and how does it help you shape you good questions so i mean i mean and i'll share okay so for me sports is extremely emotional and i'll tell you why uh, my father was again on sport not right uh, i have memories of as a kid going and watching cricket matches in maidans of mumbai right uh, I, when i was growing up i could miss a days i mean i could miss school to watch a test match to go watch a test match live right uh, and uh, i watched my father fairly early So maybe I mean, uh, but for me, so that you know that experience. So I remember I was in a boarding school, right, with no TV. So when I came back from my summer break, the entire 1992 World Cup was recorded for me in VHS tapes, right. So each innings was one VHS tape. So I binge watched 92 World Cup like two months later or three months, and I didn't even do well in that World Cup. But you know, it was just that experience, right. I mean, it showed how much someone cared, and he did that his bit to get me interested in sport, right. So I still miss some of that bit, right? That uh, I remember '94 soccer World Cup was in the US. It was late at night, and in those days there was no 24-hour news channel, right? There was that if you miss the game, you would only know next day prime time television. You would not know in the morning, right? No Google, none of that. So my dad and I devised this relay system where he would watch one game. So I think he used to watch the 2:30 game at night. At 4:30 he would finish watching the game, wake me up, and go. I would watch the next game. but he would put out the score and his analysis on a sheet of paper i would watch the second game put out my analysis and then I'd go off to school so we both got like we watched one match each and in a kind of shared notes for the other person so when i would go to school i would be like the guy only guy who knew the score and was <laughs> like right etc right so for me that's what the sports has played a very very important role i mean i might almost say that you know in terms of building my character right uh Taught me. I mean, I think all my values I get from there somehow, maybe. Uh, mm-hmm. But more than that, on an emotional level, it's still my connect with my dad. Yeah. So I think it's been uh, now almost uh, you know twenty four, twenty five years since I lost him. But it is that's my connect with him. It's my strongest connect with him even today. Thanks. I I didn't know that it would uh, take such an emotional answer out of you. Uh, thanks for sharing it uh, and for the viewers. Um, you know, I I concur with you with. Uh, you know, I've also learned all my values um, through sport, and it's not just. Uh, it's a very funny uh, thing. Like people learn, you know, these values by playing or by being in a team and such. And of course, I did that. But my biggest uh, education in values was watching Arsene Wenger uh, take press conferences because he was always uh, railing about the values of the game. And at that age, you wonder what are the values that he's talking about because either you win or you lose. uh when i spent uh i think now 14 15 years watching arsenal in which they've not won a lot but you know i keep watching 
and he's left now so i sort of wonder why i'm watching and I, then i realize that i'm probably watching because this is a, this is what taught me and made me a big big part played a big part in why i am so i think i fully fully believe oh, that's just what i started this with right that amazing brand loyalty you will not <laughs> have brand loyalty in any other industry or any other segment right so yeah in fact uh, there's this quote about how you can change your why your uh, your education your language your home but you can't change your football club so <laughs> so stuck with the uh, arsenal and but what stuck with the emotion of sport as well and uh, i think it's been a very very interesting chat and thank you for uh, being here with us and and giving us the time thank and you so much i hope uh, i hope those watching have learned a lot that we have um hope to catch up with you sometime later as well so thank you thank you so much sir pleasure sir